Thank you, worship team. And as I was sitting there listening to the Lord and meditating, the Lord reminded me out of the blue of a time about probably 14 years ago where when we were back in the States on a home assignment from Nicaragua, and we were only in the States for about a month and a half or so before we were going to return, and we had lost about probably 30 or 40% of our monthly support during that time. And it was the month of July, and all of our family and other people said, you can't go back to Nicaragua, you have to stay and raise support. It's not wise to go back, you have to stay. And I knew that that would be disobedience to God, that we were planning and set going back about the third week of July. And we did go back with very little money to cover our needs, but by faith knowing that God would provide and that we need to be obedient, that God was testing us to see if we were going to be faithful or not. And yet the counsel of family and other Christians was, you can't go, you have to stay. That's just dumb to go when you don't have enough money. And we went back without enough money. In the month of August, a donor sent in, unknowingly, a check of $5,000 to the mission, which carried us through for several months. And it just showed, once again, when you obey Christ, how Christ will supply every bit, every single need, and beyond what you don't deserve, giving you joys and desires of your heart that you couldn't even imagine, and yet so many people won't believe it. If it's not in their bank account, they don't believe God is legit. They don't believe God will provide. How sad and boring it is to live life like that, amen? Well, I think it's interesting. It's Memorial Day weekend, and we're in Matthew 5, 5. Because it is impressive when you see political strength, when you see the strength of an entire army. It's impressive to see a uniformed six foot three, four marine, and a very muscular, well-built, and ready for battle, when you see that image, it is impressive. People are impressed with the richest people in the world. They're awed by the billions and billions that they have, that they can buy anything they want at any time. They can move politicians. They can affect entire countries. That is impressive to any one of us. But what is not impressive to the world is the attribute of meekness. The Jews believed the Messianic kingdom would be brought on through military power and a political power that would be, to a degree, supernatural. They believed someone like King Saul, King David, or King Solomon would return, would come as the Messiah, defeat and destroy the Romans, and free them from decades and decades of political oppression and abuse. They were looking for someone with human supernatural strength to free them politically and nationally. They could never believe or never even wanted to fathom that it was God's will that the earth would be inherited for them through a Messiah that was principally a meek and mild and gentle Messiah. That reality they were not willing to understand and they were not willing to accept. Remember in this series of Matthew, Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, giving us Jesus' first sermon, that this, these Beatitudes are building blocks for all of Christianity. These are the attributes of Jesus, and one builds upon the other. In the past several weeks, we talked about first, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's where everything starts, brokenness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I know that even throughout the week, the Lord was revealing things in your own hearts that you needed to mourn. And I want to say thank you for those sermon responses. Digitally and physical copies, many of you responded, and that is a joy to me when I see God working in your heart and life, and I can pray for those requests. They make a difference. They matter. And I want to encourage each and every one of you, if I receive 20, 30, 40, 50 sermon responses, and I like see that whole pile and think, oh boy, I have to go through every single one of these, read them, and pray for them, do you not understand that that is not a weight to me? That is a blessing 
because I know God's at work in your spirit. He is at work in your soul, and that is to be treasured. How many times people go through suffering for years because they simply will not confess the needs of their hearts. Mourning leads to the next attribute mentioned, the next beatitude. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Everyone trying to keep up with the Joneses, can you turn the mic down? Everyone keeping up with the Joneses thinks that if I work hard and I'm able to obtain a certain amount of money before I even retire, I am going to somehow inherit the earth. That's why all these people are doing crazy hours and doing all these projects and are so greedy because they think the more greedy I am, the more likely I am going to surpass maybe the Joneses and I will inherit the earth. Is anyone thinking that if I want to have happiness and joy in this life, I better be the meekest person in my neighborhood? I better be the meekest person in all of Gallatin Valley, and no matter where I go, I better be the meekest person that I can imagine by God's power, by the gospel of Jesus working in my life. Who thinks like that? No one does. And remember what we talked about, and the reason behind the way Matthew is written is to show the comparison between Moses and Jesus. Do you remember that? This is another example And we are going to spend more time uh, than normal talking about Moses because of this reason. Jesus fulfilled in perfection everything Moses did in imperfection. Moses received the law on the mountain, Mount Sinai. Jesus gave the law from a mountain. Moses led Israel to the promised land, and Jesus' person is the promise fulfilled. Here's what's interesting Moses, and we're going to study this in Numbers chapter 12, but Jesus led Israel to the promised land, how? Through military power and conquest and political clout? Or did he lead Israel to the promised land in meekness? Moses and Israel were baptized in the Red Sea. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Moses and Israel spent 40 years in the desert Jesus spent 40 days in the desert being tempted. Here's the amazing thing. When we truly understand the meekness of Jesus of Moses, we're going to understand even more the meekness of Jesus Christ. So let's all turn please to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. This is an amazing amazing story about Moses. Moses, cha- excuse me, Numbers chapter 12, 1 through 9. Numbers chapter 12, 1 through 9. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. And I'm going to stop here. They were about to attack Moses and his leadership and to criticize him and belittle his leadership. And the Lord heard it. We talk about God's omniscience. God hears everything that anyone has ever said in false accusation against you. Do not pretend that God does not hear what others say falsely against you. Now the man Moses was very meek. He was what? Very meek. More than all people who were on the face of the earth. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward and he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. In a vision I speak with him in a dream. Oh, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And then we know what happened to Miriam. 
she became leprous like snow because of what she did against God's servant. This is amazing. The meekest man on earth, and yet God spoke directly in form to Moses. And yet that did not create any pride, any arrogancy in Moses whatsoever. Actually, it most likely created more meekness because he realized, who am I that God would speak to me directly? And he bore that weight upon his shoulders in humility and in gentleness. He was known. We have to stop and pause here. That meekness of Moses. Did Miriam take full advantage of Moses' meekness to criticize him and belittle him as the leader of Israel? She did. Remember on our Mother's Day messages, there's not all good women and mothers. There's really wonderful, godly, noble mothers, and then there's really bad, evil mothers, right? So on Mother's Day, there's this whole thing, like if it's Mother's Day, that all mothers across the globe are wonderful, godly, terrific ladies. That's simply a lie. And, and I believe this. When pastors do that, they, they belittle all the godly women who have cried out and sacrificed for their children and their husbands. Do you, know, do you realize that? You're just belittling all the truly godly mothers when you just do a blanket statement out there. Miriam at this point is doing something extremely wicked. And that's why we need to stop here. What is more important? The elders, when they all meet together and taking leadership decisions for the church over doctrine, discipline, and direction of the church, is that just what's most important when those meetings happen or when they go home and talk to their wives? Because do you know how many churches have been destroyed and divided because the men all meet together and are in unison in the decisions for the church They go home and tell their wives, their wives are not in agreement, and the next elders meeting is a disaster. And those men start to fight and hate each other. I have heard exactly, directly from people involved in those situations of it happening. Miriam took full advantage of Moses' meekness, and she attacked him. Did Moses ever defend himself? When Moses, and we, we gotta, we got to spend a lot of time understanding what meekness really is because there's a lot of misconceptions about what it truly is. Was Moses always a gentle man or was at times he a violent man? He killed a man because of his temper and we must say he was defending his fellow Israelites. But yet he still committed murder because that man was an authority over them. He was violent. Did God change Moses? He certainly did. But once again, we see something powerful in Moses that he would not defend himself. Now, if you were the leader of an entire nation, roughly 2 million people, God appeared in his form in in a pre-incarnate Uh, presence of Christ, and he spoke directly. The God of the universe spoke directly to you, not in visions, not in dreams like it says in the text. Would that not produce an incredible amount of arrogancy in you or me if anyone tried to criticize or attack me? Oh, you're not the main leader. When everyone knows only God speaks to Moses. I don't know about you, but that would create an incredible amount of arrogancy in me. How dare you? Do you know I am Moses, the first ever leader that brought you out of Egypt? Do you not see the miracles God performed through me? I parted, God through me parted an entire ocean. Does that not impress you? And you have the audacity to criticize my leadership. Well, there's jealousy in Miriam. Why can't my husband be as powerful and why can't God speak directly to my husband because after all I'm his wife do you see how a woman thinks do you see how destructive that is and yet Moses did not defend himself in ministry over the past 23 plus years yes 
men have attacked me and criticized me and done very unjust things to me. But the women behind the scenes have caused more destructive destruction to me personally and hurt and pain to my family and to the church of Jesus Christ than men ever have. So that money, a big amount of money we lost in July and we had to go back to Nicaragua, our plane tickets were bought and everything. When I preached to that church, people responded in such a powerful way that they never respond that way to the normal senior pastor. So because of that one message on a Sunday morning, that senior pastor lost his kingdom. Because people were repenting, people were responding, people were talking about it after church, and for weeks later. But after the service, and people were making jokes, and he ended on time. Meaning the pastor never does. And the pastor's wife said this. And we know this because people directly told us Sunday afternoon after the service what she said. Mind you, the Spirit of God powerfully worked, and it's a big church, powerfully worked that Sunday morning. And the pastor's wife said this to other people in the church. He will never preach in our church again. And sure enough, a short time later, we lost all that support from that church. Do you see how dangerous it is? And that when leaders are meek, when husbands are meek, and the woman is not a good woman, they will attack and usurp that as much as they can. But in the end, it doesn't matter. God will be your defense. God will defend. And Moses learned that lesson. And here's the nuance in Hebrew. Here's the amazing thing about meekness. Learning gentleness, listen to this, through affliction. Did Moses learn gentleness and meekness through affliction? God took 80 years to prepare Moses. So for all of you that maybe have a tendency to be more aggressive or violent, God will take his time, but God will take any man, any woman that might be tending towards aggression and violence and turn him in or her into a gentle lamb. Who can do that but the Spirit of God? The same man that easily killed an Egyptian is saying nothing when he is attacked by Aaron and Miriam. Who can do that except the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit? That gives you and I hope, doesn't it? It gives us an understanding of what the work of God is does in our life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moses, even being the meekest man on, on earth, still struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And therefore, he paid a huge consequence. He was not allowed to enter into the promised land. But yet, Numbers 12 said he was the meekest man on, in all of the earth. And we know his record as a spiritual father of Israel. He is known still to this day, not because of striking the rock, not because of killing an Egyptian. He is known because he was the meekest man in all of earth. His entire life was measured in meekness, and his few episodes of anger and, and, or violence were swallowed up by a lifetime of gentleness. By being humble and gentle, power under control, you subdue the earth. There is no enemy that can master you. Anger cannot control you. Hatred will never fill you. And envy will not touch you. Revenge will never be on your lips. And there will be no need to ever defend yourself. This is the result of being meek. Remember the building blocks. I cannot ever get to the point of meekness if I do not start first with being poor in spirit. That I am broken. I am unworthy. I have nothing to offer God or anyone else. It is Romans chapter 7. Paul crying out, Oh wretched man am I. Who will save me from this body of death? Paul exemplifies being poor in spirit. Amen. And that leads to the mourning. I mourn over my wickedness, my depravity, what I've done to my family, what I've done to other people, strangers and 
friends, what I've done against God in my heart and in my mind and with my body, with the members of my body, that is to be mourned. That is something we could see as negative, and then it leads to something positive. Happy are the meek. So you have to go through the brokenness, the poor in spirit, the mourning, to be able to lead to the meekness. Look at these building blocks that are so clear in Scripture. In the Greek, it was used of an animal, wild in spirit, who was broken by a trainer so that they could do useful work. So you are wild. Maybe you still are wild. I don't know. Maybe you have more Joaquins and tat- uh, more tattoos than Joaquin has. I don't know. But you were wild in heart, and God broke you, useful for His kingdom. So is God really concerned about how wild you have been or are right now? Thinking, oh man, that guy, he's too wild for me. I'm not used to dealing with wild men. Or can God break any wild, not just men, there's a lot of wild women in Montana, aren't there? There's a lot of wild women and wild men that God can easily break. God took 80 years to break Moses. That is a long time. I pray that God does not take that long with any of us. And Jesus, for this reason, came into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, riding on a donkey. Do you think for most of those Jews, there was a small group, but that same group said crucify him seven days later. Do you think for that group, those group of Jews that was hard for them? Like, who wants to see a six-foot-three Marine coming in to battle on a donkey? Like, it sort of just takes out, takes every, all the wind out of the sails, doesn't it? That does not impress our human flesh. We want to see political and military and economic power. And Jesus came, it says in Matthew 21.5, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Donkeys were only good for doing what? Going into battle? Or were they only good for carrying burdens, weight, cargo? Remember the building blocks of God's kingdom. Meekness means we are looking unto God's holiness. Poor in spirit means we are looking internally at our depravity, at our wickedness, at our sin. But meekness turns our eyes into God's glory, His holiness, His purity, and His righteousness. And you could think of Isaiah 6, 1-8, through 8, when Isaiah saw the glory of God and it broke him even more. Why? Because his focus was on the holiness of God. We have to be clear about something about meekness because it doesn't mean, and Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones has an entire section in his book on the Sermon on the Mount about this issue. Meekness does not mean a man or a woman that is totally passive or nice. This has nothing to do with your personality. Oh, that person is so nice, would not hurt a flea. That has nothing to do with meekness at all. Just because you were biologically have a certain personality does not mean you are a meek person. So think of it as a scale, lazy passivity on one end and violent aggression on the other. And meekness is Jesus in the middle. He knows exactly what to do at the right time because why? Meekness is simply power under control. It does not mean someone who is a wimp who can't stand up to the truth with the truth and he cannot defend the helpless or the poor. It is someone that has an incredible amount of strength, but harnesses it and knows how to use it to protect. Meekness is never about defending myself. And people have asked me, even last week, I got a question on what is holy anger? Sadly, most of us do not have holy anger when we get mad. But holy anger means that you get angry when someone has sinned against the glory of God. It is not personal. They did nothing against you. They didn't attack you. They didn't criticize you. And, and because of that injustice, you all of a sudden have this burning anger in your heart. And you think it's good. It's justifiable. Because what that person did was totally unjust and wrong against me. That is not meekness. That is not holy anger. 
Holy anger means the person or group of people did something against the glory of God. They injured other believers. They hurt innocent people. It has nothing to do with me. Therefore, I am angry with a holy indignation. And meek people are going to feel that anger just like Moses did. When he came out from, down from Mount Sinai and Israel, I mean, it's really disgusting, but Israel was into full-on idol worship and orgies. They were doing disgusting things while Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. At that time, when Moses slew those, some of those people, and his anger burned, he broke the Ten Commandments, was that a holy anger? When Jesus cleansed the temple, not once, but twice, was that a holy anger? And here's something that a lot of people don't really talk about in Jesus' character, because he was perfect in everything he did. Was his violence completely justified in the temple? Absolutely. So was Jesus violent two times while he was in his earthly ministry? He says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers, robbers Matthew 21, 12 through 17. What did he do? It says, he entered the temple, drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money char- changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Jesus was violent. Twice he cleansed the temple. Why? Because his father's glory was being attacked. The temple was to be a house of prayer, not a place of economic gain. That is the description of holy anger, and meek people have holy anger. Most of the time, again, brothers and sisters in Christ, is our anger holy? Or is it almost always because we are not meek people We get so easily offended when someone did something against me. So, do I have any problem saying that I'm a sinner? I'm a depraved, wicked sinner, and I deserve hell? I I don't. I can say that freely. What if someone says that about you, though? Does it change the equation? I can say that all that day because it's me saying it. Here's the, the scary thing. That does not mean I'm meek. The test is when someone comes and says, oh, you're such a depraved sinner. Then I want to, what? Defend myself. I want to attack the other person. So when that happens, it shows that I'm truly not a very meek person. Because Moses is a sinner, an example of what the work of the Holy Spirit did in his life. And Jesus is the perfect example of, He did not utter a word. He was led to slaughter. As a sheep, he went in silence. And so that truly is the test of meekness, isn't it? Like, is it hard if you're not a meek person at all and you're very prideful and self-righteous, is it easy to hear the messages at Petra Bible Church? Like, two people shake their head. You can be honest. Is it easy to hear the messages from this church if you do not have meekness in your life? Will you run and never come back? Therefore, the messages should be as they are. Because they are to expose our hearts. Because number one, meekness is required for salvation. Number one, for those who are taking notes, meekness is required for salvation. All the church fathers taught that. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Matthew Henry, even today, John MacArthur. Remember, Matthew 5, 3 through 12 is the entirety of the Christian life. It is progressive. Do, Do the Beatitudes get easier or do they get harder as they move along? Because it's one thing to be broken in spirit. Man, I've, I've, excuse the language, screwed up so much in my life. I've messed up so much in my life. I can say that. But then to mourn over it, over what I've done to people, oh, that's another level, isn't it? I've got to mourn the damages I've caused and the pain I've caused, people I've loved or, or people on the street. 
I've got to mourn that. Oh, then it goes to meekness of the gentleness and not defend myself when I'm unjustly attacked. Oh, that's even harder. I might as well give up now. And that's why most people stop coming to church. That's why if you come to Petra Bible Church for six months and there's not repentance in your life, it's going to be really, really hard to stay at this church. Super hard. Because things get harder as you progress in the Christian life. Here's the amazing thing. Does the power of God, though, increase even more? It it does because you realize, I can't do this on my own. Could you commit, complete, excuse me, the Ten Commandments on your own? What about the moral law of God in Leviticus and Numbers? Deuteronomy. What about the Sermon on the Mount? It's even worse. Oh, I can't. It's not the fact, oh, I just simply won't commit adultery and I won't be with another woman. Well, that's hard, but not that hard. But then Jesus says he who lusts for a woman has committed adultery with her in her heart. In her heart. That's even ten times worse. Who can fulfill the Sermon on the Mount without the power of God? No one. Who can be totally gentle and meek and kind when you are attacked falsely and justly? Who can do that without someone being overwhelmed by the power of God and loving the other person unconditionally? That is an amazing, amazing reality. And we're going to look at all the verses behind this. Number two, meekness is essential for Christian living and puts our Christ on our eyes, excuse me, on Christ's example. It puts our eyes on Christ's example. And number three, meekness prepares our soul and gives vision for the new heavens and the new earth. Meekness prepares our soul and gives vision for the new heavens and the new earth. And I'm going to go ahead and read this quote by pastor, preacher George MacDonald in the late 1800s in Scotland. He said this, We cannot see the world as God means it in the future, save as our souls are characterized by meekness. In meekness, we are, we are its only inheritors. Meekness alone makes his spiritual retina pure to receive God's things as they are, mingling with them neither imperfection nor impurity. Do you see what he's saying? Without meekness, I do not have God's view of the world. I cannot see the glories of God all around me. Right in front of my face, the beauty and majesty of Jesus inheritance that God desires of me of the world. If there is no meekness, I will be blind forever. Always trying to keep up with the Joneses, always trying to make myself more dominant, more important than anyone else around me. I am blinded to what meekness is meant for. It is to purify the retina of my eye so that I can clearly see the glories of God before me. If there is no meekness, you will never ask and call out to God and praise his name for the rays of the sun. We could have the most beautiful rains that have happened this past week and not see the glory of Christ in any one of those droplets. We could see the color contrast flowing over the bridges or the Spanish peaks and not stand and be in awe of the glory of God because there is no meekness in our life. There is no humility. There is no gentleness. It's always give me, give me, give me more, more, more because I deserve it. Maybe you are not even truly saved. Thus the great importance of meekness. It gives me the vision of the glories of God all around me. What is the result of meekness? No one. No one can dominate, enslave, or oppress the meek. I'm going to say this again. No one can dominate, enslave, or oppress the meek. The meek live freely upon the earth because the earth belongs to them. It does not belong to the George Soros, the Bill Gates. It does not belong to any of our political leaders. The world belongs to the meek. Something that we cannot understand apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came as a gentle lamb, a baby, but yet he will come back as a warrior, king of kings and lord of lords. His wrath will be upon the earth. Why is that important to know? 
because of this verse, Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his justice, whose just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So when the Lord comes back, will he come back as a gentle lamb or will he come back as a roaring lion? Will he come back not defending himself or will he come back in, fu- in full fury of his wrath? So to prepare my heart for that, the meek will be saved. The humble, the gentle in spirit are preparing for that day. The arrogant prepare for nothing because they believe they already have the earth. But remember in Genesis 1.28, man was to have dominion over the whole earth, but his pride and self-dependence destroyed that dominance, and man became subject to the earth and toiled all his days under its oppressive weight. So look at Adam. He had dominion over all of the earth. That was the instruction. That was the privilege. That was the gift of God. He lost it because he became self-dependent, self-trust, self-righteous. And he inherited what? The wind. That's why it is so amazing to see the power and the importance of Psalm 37, 11. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. It didn't say, it doesn't say the billionaires, it doesn't say the military leaders, the generals, the presidents, the kings. It says the meek shall inherit the earth, the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Almost a direct quote in Matthew 5.5, 5, isn't it? Remember Matthew? One of the main purposes to reach the Jewish audience was the most citations of the Old Testament out of all of the Gospels. There is a reason behind it. The meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. How many of you want to enjoy peace? I do. And can you enjoy peace when someone is falsely attacking and accusing you? Can you? Well, you certainly can if you have the meekness of Christ. The ones that falsely accuse you and attack you will not inherit the earth, but the meek will inherit the earth the earth don't you think that if we want to do things God's way and be successful there is no other way except through meekness the world would see meekness as as the key to success as something to mock and to laugh out how stupid how ridiculous it is the all-powerful it is the billionaires that rule the earth and Jesus says you fools it is the meek who rule the earth 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says this, Or you do not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of of our God. Isn't that amazing? And how many so-called Christians are justifying fornication, idolatry, adultery, and homosexuality think, oh, we just need to be tolerant. We just need to love them. You do not love them. You hate them. If you truly love those that are struggling with their sexual identity, you will preach the gospel to them. Your sin will lead you to hell. You need Jesus in your life. As such, some of them were involved in those things, but now they've been redeemed, they've been washed, they've been sanctified, they've been made new. That is so exciting. That's what homosexuals need to hear. That's the truth, that there is is true love towards all of those people. And yet, we're not, oh, fornication, that's not a big deal. Like, Like, live in 2023. We don't live in 1950. The destruction for adultery, the destruction for sexual immorality is immense. It is those that are meek that will recognize, I have nothing to offer God. I must fall upon his mercy. Because Psalm 25, 9 says this, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. 
Let me say that again. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. God does not speak to the arrogant. He speaks to the humble. All of us, from time to time, even in the middle of the same day, can struggle immensely with pride. And we feel like it's justified. And the more maybe we've suffered or been through trauma in our life, the more maybe that we can justify easily our pride. But God will not speak to you. God opposes the proud, amen, but gives grace to the humble. This church, we do not have anything to offer God or this valley. All we have is the privilege and the joy to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell people they need Jesus. Judgment is coming. Matthew 18, 2 through 4 says this, And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humbles himself like a child. Why do you think Satan is attacking our children so much? To create so much pride and anger and resentment and bitterness in them that they turn out to be violent, violent people that have no problem killing innocent people. That's what the world is doing. That's what Satan is doing. To attack our children so there will be no humility in their souls whatsoever. And Jesus is very clear. We are to be humble like a little child. Being around children is a wonderful thing to teach us humility, isn't it? I'm not talking about the eight or nine-year-olds. I'm talking about the five, six-year-olds. To learn humility by their questions, by their interest, by their intrigue, by their submission. Because why? Those five-year-olds are so helpless and they know it. Anything will scare them. And as such, the meekness of Christ is shown through little children. And we easily and quickly forget that lesson. Once again, meekness means power under control. It does not mean that you are a Mr. Nice Guy. It does not mean that when people are doing wrong things, you say nothing. You remain quiet. That is not what meekness means. So I'm going to ask each and every one of you, do you believe money, political or military power, sports or education, or notoriety, notoriety will lead you to conquer and inherit the earth? I'm going to ask it again. Do you believe money, political or military power, Sports, education, or notoriety will lead you to conquer and inherit the earth because most people miss church because they believe that. Do I want my children to inherit the earth? Do I? Do you? Do you love your children that you desire that your children inherit the earth? Or do you even care? So parents... Why are you pursuing everything that will take your children away from inheriting the kingdom of God? I knew a, a surgeon. We were friends with him. Every summer, he was very smart, but he'd focus on summer school for his boys. When they were very little, they'd have to go through all of the summer curriculum and books that he pressed down upon them. Supposedly a strong Christian, and it was a lie. Because what he really believed, if I push education with my two boys, that will enable them to inherit the earth. How sad, truly sad. A college degree does not make you inherit the earth. Making six-figure incomes every year does not make you inherit the earth. Becoming powerful in your physical body and getting stronger and stronger physically does not allow you to inherit the earth. Being a rock star, a superstar, and gaining all this notoriety for your athletic ability does not allow you to inherit the earth. 
So I'm going to ask each and every one of you, why do you focus so much on that which is not eternal? What authority do you value? What possessions do you long for? The more you obtain what everyone in Bozeman has, will it, if you get to that level that you so long for, will it allow you to inherit the earth? Say, for example, you're able, your business explodes in success, and you're able to be a multimillionaire before you turn age 60. Some of you don't have much time. <laughs> Say that that were to happen. If you reach that, would you inherit the earth? Because most multimillionaires I have known are pretty bored. What do you value? What do you believe? If I possess this, it will bring me the security, the inheritance I so long for. The moment someone receives Jesus in their heart, they receive the inheritance of the kingdom of God, yes or no? The moment, not five seconds later, like Pentecostal teaching and you speak in tongues, then you'll really receive it. What a lie. You receive it. You are baptized by Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. Does everyone understand that? The Holy Spirit doesn't baptize. It never does. never has. Jesus is the baptizer. Look in the Gospel of John. Jesus is the one that baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And at the moment of salvation, you inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, there is no more obsession over education, over sports, over making a certain amount of money, over having these certain things. At that point, I have the kingdom of God inside my soul. Why do I need anything else? It is a simple rec recognition of what truly matters in life and eternity. And so many parents could care less about eternity. They're only focusing on the here and now. And they need to repent. What do you long to obtain in this world in order to believe that you have inherited this earth? Does it matter if my child breaks a school sports record? Does it matter if my child gets straight A's and gets accepted into Stanford or if he or she is going to hell? And, and the supposedly Christian parents will say, oh, no, 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 I know that their salvation is the most important thing ever. Oh, yeah, 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 Pastor Jared, I totally believe that. Your life as a parent shows the exact opposite. You do not believe the very words that are coming out of your mouth, and you need to repent because you are sending your child's soul to hell. I think it's funny, okay, I think it's funny that my kids have such athletic ability, all four of them, and they really don't care about sports. Like, yeah. Why? Because what they've seen on the mission field of suffering. And how much our kids here in this country need to see that. They see what matters. If people are paralyzed or handicapped, and they're crawling on the ground to do basic work to pick up logs or sticks to make a fire, to cook tortillas or chicken or something. They're crawling on the ground. When you see that as a kid, you're never the same even as an adult. I'll never forget stopping in the, in the intersections in Nicaragua and Managua and seeing handicapped people, their, their legs completely crippled. And they'd have gloves on their hands because the pavement, of course, was, it's hot. It's always 90 to 100 degrees there. They would have gloves on their hands, and they would pull themselves and walk with their hands in the middle of the street begging for money. When you see that every day, yeah, you think sports are pretty stupid. And may God have mercy on us when we lose eyesight, we lose clarity, and we get distracted. And we forget those images and what those people are suffering. God forgive us, amen, because we're going to be judged for that.
It's the meek who will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Happy are the meek. Isaiah 57, 13 says this, When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. I love that. Let your sports and your education and your money and all your vacations and all that you have, let it, let it deliver you. The wind will carry them all off. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. I don't know about you, but that verse blows me away. Let your collection of idols deliver you. I love that. God is mocking them. There's a lot of lot of rich people in Bozeman and Big Sky, aren't there? I've never been around so many rich people in my life. You have the inheriting the kingdom of heaven. They have nothing. Do you really believe that? You are inheriting the kingdom of God. They're inheriting the wind. Does that change the way you think? Does that change the way you view what you have or you don't have? Does that make you content with what God has given you? And that contentment filled my heart, working outside, doing yard work almost the whole day, seeing the beauty of the wind and the rain and the sky and the mountains, thanking the Lord, thank you, Lord, that I can even have legs and have the strength to actually work because a lot of people can't. And to have that joy saying, Lord, thank you that I can sit in a chair and listen to the word of God without being extreme back pain. And that I can go home and be with my family and I have food in the refrigerator. Thank the Lord because those that are meek treasure the little things. They understand what it means to be poor in spirit. They understand what it means to be broken and have nothing to offer God. They understand what it means to mourn over what their sin has caused. And what the sin of other people has caused them. They mourn both. And so dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you make must make a decision, what will you treasure on this earth? Because there's in our, in our, it's that sinful tendency, I want to treasure the military power. I want to treasure all the money. I want to treasure what everyone else has. I want to treasure that my kids are the best at this or that and the other. Who cares what your kids are the best at? May your children only have one desire only. They know without a doubt that they're going to heaven why are parents so evil that they put sports in front of their child's soul and their eternal destiny? Doesn't it grieve the heart of God that I love your child and his eternal destiny and you don't because you put everything in front of me and your children will grow up and repeat the same thing. And just because there are Christian schools that exist, does not mean ever that a parent is putting their child's soul first. It may very well hide the fact that they're not. Don't ever believe that lie and that deception. God will never work apart from his church. He died for the church. Sunday does not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus Christ. He died for Sunday. He rose again on the third day. Dear church, it's time for awakening in our hearts and our lives. And you are mature enough and you have grown enough in this church. You are ready to receive these hard messages. You may not think you are, but you are ready. Because God has placed you here. He has broken you. He has caused so many things to happen in your life to bring you to this point in time of hearing these messages. Meekness isn't natural for you and I. Is it natural to me? Absolutely not. Is it natural in marriage? Is it natural with rebellious children? Is it natural for children with their parents? It is not at all. It must be the power of the Holy Spirit. No one can make me meek apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. I will continually want to defend myself and be angry over the injustices when really it's all my pride. I 
I didn't know if this was time or not for this kind of message, but God was burning my heart. I don't know what summer, kind of summer you think you're going to have or you want to have. But I want to encourage each and every one of you to give this summer over to the Lord and for his glory. This summer belongs to him, just like every day of the year belongs to him. Can you imagine a church like ours, a new church, a church plant filled with people that are truly meek? that inherit the earth, that all working in unison with the vision to have the Lord build this church to reach this valley in a way that has never been done in its entire history. The history of Bozeman in Montana, it's not a very good history, is it? Pretty violent. But yet God would so powerfully work to turn people into meek people who love Jesus And what if we all work together that not individually, everyone's trying to keep up with the Joneses, doing their own things separate from one another, but in synergy and unity and a true family of God, every single one of you is working together to build God's kingdom because you know that's the only thing worth living for. There's nothing that compares with that. And I want to ask each and every one of you as I pray to make a decision. The Lord, I surrender my summer to you. I surrender my plans to you. And I pray that even though right now I can't say on all honesty, I'm a very meek person, but Lord, Moses wasn't a meek person, but look what you did in his life. That's the power of the gospel to change any of us. In my flesh, I want physical strength to be able to change the outcome that I don't like. And God says, it is not that way. It is through meekness. Dear church, to miss church because of vacation or a special family trip or because you don't feel good, you're literally getting sick, that's normal. When it becomes a habit, you must ask yourself, am I truly saved? Do I really know Jesus? Because people think, well, I've got this, I've got that to do. Well, don't you understand that the more you really don't want Jesus, don't you get it? that the more excuses God's going to give you? He will. It's by way of judgment. Oh, yeah, those excuses work for the rest of the Christians. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense why you didn't come. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, everyone accepts those good excuses, but what they don't understand is God gave them those excuses to bring judgment on their life, not blessing. You don't want me? I'll make sure that you don't get me. Americans, they they can't conceive of that. It doesn't enter their brain to even ponder that reality. Is God going to honor you for being faithful to his church? Do you believe that? The meek recognize that and see it and follow it. But dear church, I don't know about you, but life is short. We do not know how much time we have on this earth. Tanya talking with Kate Johnson, who just lost her husband three months ago, once again reminds us how fragile life is. He was a young man and died in a second. If you do not live for the kingdom of God today, when will you ever live for God's kingdom? You are given the opportunity now. The book of Joel says today is the day of salvation. Are you sure if you die today, you know absolutely sure Pastor Jared, I know that I was a sinner. I was lost, and God saved me. I heard the gospel. I responded, and God saved my soul. And now there is fruit of true salvation in my life. I want to read my Bible. I want to go to church. I want to share Jesus. I want to pray. I want to experience intimacy with Christ. And if that is not part of your heart, you are not saved. Quit trying to justify in all these gray areas, it's black and white. You either cry out to God, you love Jesus, you want to read his word, or you have no interest. You are playing a game with yourself, and you're playing a game with God. And our evangelical world is wonderful at playing that game. And God says judgment is coming. 
my judgment is for sure. So dear church, you need to understand, I don't worry about offending you at all. I worry about you not being truly born again. You entering into uh, eternity without really knowing Jesus in your heart because you were deceived. You thought you were a good person and you were not broken in spirit. You were not mourning over your sin. You did not come to the meekness of Christ. That's what worries me. That's what keeps me up at night. You think, oh, that doesn't keep you up at night? Yes, it does. Because I pray for your souls. Because some of you think you're saved and you're really not. You don't think God gives me a spirit of discernment in vain? That we are not to judge the heart of man, but we are to judge the works of man. We are to judge what man does and does not do inside the local church. That is God's calling. My number one concern is because it's God's number one concern. Are you truly born again? Is there fruits of repentance in your life or not? If you don't have any desire to read God's word or love Jesus or grow in Jesus, that means right now you most likely are going to hell. That should put the fear of God in your heart. And as we pray right now, I pray that God would do so a powerful work that if you have to come up and say, Pastor Jared, I need prayer. I don't know if I'm truly born again. Then you do that and don't leave without knowing for sure that you're going to spend an eternity with God in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Lord, I feel so burdened. And I know it's not me, it's from you. Just like Eric's dad, he had one concern that his dad would come to Christ before death. And by faith, he did. Jesus, there's nothing more important than eternal life. And Lord, I've missed the mark so many times in my life, and it's reminding me over and over again how much I need the gospel. And Lord, I pray for the souls of every single man, woman, and child here. If there's someone with a doubt that, that really is not sure if they're eternal life, if they have eternal salvation, that, Lord, you would work in that person and show them how wonderful and amazing you are. And that salvation is right here. But, Lord, in the future, it will not be. And so, Lord, I pray that every single person in this room would know for sure, I know that Jesus is in my heart and life. I am his child. He loved me. He died for me. He rescued me from my own violence and my own aggression, my own rebellion. And Lord, is there anything more important than eternal life? Is there anything more important than making sure that my soul is going to heaven, that my children know you as Lord and Savior? Lord, I pray that you give us courage. That, Father, there will be no one here too scared to say, I need help. I need salvation. Lord, please move in everyone's hearts. Father, for there is nothing greater than when your salvation comes down and transforms the heart of a man, a woman, or a child. So, Lord, I pray that you would do an amazing work today, this morning. And that, Lord, for those that are truly saved, for those of us that struggle with meekness or not being meek, I pray that there would be repentance in our hearts right now. The anger, the violence, the temper that we lose too often. That, Lord, we would truly repent of that right now. Saying, Lord, I confess. I haven't mourned these things. I haven't been broken in spirit, which is why I struggle with so much anger in my life. I need to be broken so that I'm a useful tool in your hand. I need to mourn the losses in my life and the sin that I've caused because I want to inherit the earth. I want to be a part of your kingdom. And so, Lord, transform me. 
use me. It has to be you that does the work. So, Lord, I trust in you that though right now I can't say I'm a meek person, but, Lord, by faith, you will work in my heart. You will use the word of God. You will use church. You will use the ministries. You will use other believers to produce that in me, to teach me and guide me how to surrender so that I walk and live in the meekness of Christ. Please that do that amazing work in each of our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.